Um, thank you. Thank you very much for joining um, to this training, help corals get trained in tracking coral bleaching events. Um, it's lovely to see so many participants and uh, people interested. Next slide. So my name is Andrea Rivera Sosa and I work as a project and outreach manager for the Core Reef Alliance and also the Allen Core Atlas. And we'll be having uh, some technical support, which we need today uh, from Ben Sharo, uh, program coordinator with the Global Conservation um, Science Team at Coral um, and who will be intervening in the Q&A section. So this presentation is the result of a brilliant collaboration um, among the Allen Core Atlas, Reef Check, Wildlife Conservation Society, the Mermaid uh, Platform, um, the School of Earth and Bar Environmental Science uh, from the University of Queensland, also Reef Cloud, um, a software developed by the Australian Institute of Marine Science and the Australian government. So these are some of the people behind the organizations. Um, here with us today, we have Helen Fox. We have um, from the Core Reef Alliance, we have Manuel Gonzalez Rivero from Reef Cloud Ames. And we have also uh, Chris Rolfsema uh, from the University of Queensland. Uh, thank you very much for, uh, for joining in today. And um, they'll also be helping out with some questions um, at the end, we'll make sure that we give them the hard ones <laughs> that we get for each of the each of the methods. So before we get started, I'd like to ask you a few questions to get to know you a little bit more. Um, so let me launch a quick poll um, to know more about your bleaching experience and also to know what area um, you're more than likely to monitor coral bleaching. So we see that the answers are coming in. Thank you very much. I'm very curious to see the answers and then give it um, one more minute for to get everybody's responses. We have about 85 participants um, joining us today. All right, so I think we have pretty much everybody's responses. So it seems like the majority or Mm, it keeps on changing. <laughs> um, about 60% are preparing for their first bleaching event, and about 32% have um, been in one or five bleaching events before, so have some experience. And then a lower percent, 11, um, that have been into five or more bleaching events. And so the regions. Uh, most likely to conduct the bleaching surveys. Indo-Pacific has about 60%, um, followed by the Atlantic and the Caribbean. So these folks are staying up late today. And um, we have Australia, 16%, and uh, Western Indian Ocean and the Persian Gulf with 5%. So thank you. All right, we're gonna end the poll. And sorry, I, I think I, I didn't share it before, but I think I just told you the, the results. Okay, so the overview of this training is to give you a general introduction to coral bleaching and the Allen Core Atlas. Um, also some general guidance for coral bleaching um, field surveys. And then we're gonna cover three different methods and data platforms. The belt transect from Reef Check and the Global Reef Tracker, the rapid bleaching protocol from WCS and Mermaid, and the georeference photo quadrats um, and Reef Cloud. And we'll end the session with the Q&A so we'll be able to um, answer, answer some questions. And also feel free to send the, the questions along the, um, presentation through the Q&A. 
um, and we'll respond them at the end. Thank you. Um, so coral reefs are a critical marine ecosystem. They host 25% of marine species from only 0.1% of the surface of the ocean. And coral reefs provide yet so many services to humans. Um, as you can see in the, in the next click. Um, yet on the next slide, you can see that they're at risk from serious decline from local threats, but also from global threats such as climate change. And the facts are clear. Um, the world is getting warmer and it's because of us. 97% of publishing climate scientists agree that global climate change is real and it's a result of human activity. So the increase in marine heat waves is causing more recurring and more extreme coral bleaching events. Um, using Australia's Great Barrier Reef as an example, we can observe in this graph how how over the last four decades, the GBR has been hit with massive uh, bleaching episodes, being this year the sixth event. Um, a recent study by Spatty et al. mentions how this year, 2022, represented more accumulated stress than ever before in, during the summer period for the GBR and its first mass coral bleaching event to occur um, during La Nina year. Um, which usually brings cooler water. So the um, projections for um, this year's, yes, next slide, it's fine. Um, bleaching alert um, from January to April, we have seen um, an increase in um, bleaching alerts and sea surface temperatures. Um, here's a graph provided by NOAA. And you can see the temps starting increasing in February, then escalating. Uh, so they start increasing in February, escalating in March, and then start reducing again in, um, in April. However, in the next slide, you see that projections from April to July this year um, do not look good for the Pacific. And it's important to start activating the networks in this region. So uh, we thank you for being part of the training um, today. So in the next slide, we have seen that marine heat waves increase, uh, massive bleaching events can unfold and can impact large scale reef areas if stress is prolonged and suffer, suffer more mortality. So coral bleaching can occur when corals become stressed. So the next slide. Um, from high or low water temperatures um, or other factors such as changes in water quality, light exposure, or tides. And this stress uh, causes the symbiotic algae to produce an excess in oxygen, um, resulting in the buildup of toxic waste products. So the coral host expels the symbiotic algae, leaving the coral bleached white without its built-in production source. And bleaching is complex and many intrinsic factors like those in blue um, and many external factors like those in gray can have a, an influence. But for this training, we'll focus on bleaching triggered from heat stress exposure. So now shifting scales from symbionts to satellites, um, the Allen Coral Atlas has recently launched a bleaching monitoring system to help track coral bleaching events in near real time um, to help conservation research and education in initiatives. So this monitoring system in the next, next slide, you'll see uses um, satellite imagery available from 2021 um, at a 10 meter resolution. It's also available um, globally for all shallow core reef areas that have been mapped in the Atlas. And we hope that throughout this training, you will learn different survey methods um, to collaborate and help validate and strengthen um, the tool. The bleaching monitoring system starts processing satellite images when a region enters a NOAA bleaching alert um, due to the warming waters. And then the Atlas measures the bottom reflectance or the brightness of coral reefs in alerted areas in bi-weekly periods until there is no um, stress. 
And it does this by defining a baseline color um, or bottom reflectance of a reef area during periods of colder water, which are usually um, three to four months, and then compares the brightness of reef areas during warmer water. Um, so as temperatures continue to rise, corals, um, as you know, may bleach, and this can be observed in the change in brightening over um, the reflectance values. So the difference in brightening can be observed in three bleaching categories based on the number of weeks that that brightening or reflectance has occurred. And they range from low, moderate um, to severe. And if you'd like to learn more, I invite you to explore the, the bleaching tool um, in the next slide. Uh, so you can see the Allen Core Atlas uh, website. Our tool is in beta stage and all the bleaching feedback that users um, like you can provide is extremely important. So moving along the training, um, I like to um, provide you with some general guidance for coral bleaching field surveys. So the first one is site selection. Uh, Perhaps you already have set sites or you're establishing new ones, but it's important to identify the type of habitat where you're serving and to include replicates of the shallow um, and deeper sites and note if they're exposed or shelter sites from uh, wave exposure. So for the Atlas verification purpose, back, sorry, um, we can only review areas up to 10 meter deep, but for general bleaching understanding, it's important to know how corals in deeper waters are being affected. And um, of course, within selecting the sites, safety and, and site accessibility must also come first. So the second um, very important one, and I know that Chris can, um, talk a little bit more about this, but the, it's very important to um, geo-reference the site as best as possible. So many GPS locations are taken from the boat rather than the site you survey. Um, and this is a, a very big problem. And it's an issue because one of the main requirements for using field data to validate, to validate um, satellite-based products is that each field data point collected has, a G, has an actual GPS coordinate. Um, so a GPS position should be taken to represent the site as best as possible. And this can be done with a GPS and a float, which we will cover more in detail um, in the georeference photo quadrant section. But um, I will also give you some tips on how to do this in each of the, of the methods. So the third one, is to survey corals during peak bleaching events. And this is ideally um, 21 to 30 days post peak uh, degree heating weeks. So the surveys may not be representative if they're done too early or too late. Um, so the timing of the peak bleaching season varies among ocean basins and hemispheres, but it's generally during the local summertime. So for example, the peak season is July through October in the Northern Atlantic and Pacific Oceans and January to March for the Southern Atlantic and Pacific. And the peak is April to June for the Northern Indian Ocean um, and January to April for the Southern Indian Oceans. Also, if you're able to survey corals two to three months after bleaching peak to assess recovery or mortality, um, it's also a good, um, a good thing to, to plan for. So the fourth one is to know that coral bleaching can also be colorful and not all coral bleaching is white. Um, this has been observed all over the world, so it's important to be aware of the normal um, colorations uh, of the corals in the areas that you monitor. Um, and this um, very neon and bright color coloration is thought to act as a sunscreen that may aid in the symbiont 
recanalization. Okay. Also, some corals can naturally appear white, pale, or with lighter parts. This is the case of um, Montastra cavernosa, which has a variety of pigments in the Caribbean, for example, um, including a white phenotype that is normal. And um, it was once thought that it was bleach, but it's an actual um, normal coloration. So other species tend to have white growth tips that lack pigmentation, like acroporas, um, or others that have white bumps like orbicelas. So be aware of this so that bleaching is not um, overestimated. Also, it's important to be able to distinguish recent mortality um, versus bleaching. So sometimes when we're out surveying, we see a white coral right away and we think that it's bleached. But beware the new mortality um, where the bare skeleton can be observed um, could be due to predator bites such as fish, snails, fireworms, crown of thorns, um, and could be also mortality from bleaching itself. And um, so usually when there's bleaching, you can see the, the live tissue um, still there and not the bare skeleton. Um, some other corals may appear white from coral diseases, so make sure that you take note of that. So now moving on to the section um, that everybody's been waiting for, um, the survey methods and data platform section. We know that there's many ways to survey coral conditions and that we're only going to cover um, a few today. But through this training, we will cover a snapshot of um, a few method types uh, which have higher taxonomic resolution. You can see the A and B, the diver and the photo. And these methods will allow us for further validation of the satellite based readings that we see shown in the E um, icon. And so to start off uh, as a roadmap, we'll start with reef check. Uh, which is a science, citizen science program, which surveys um, focus mostly on the marine ecosystem uh, as a whole, and the method is quite general. Then we'll cover the rapid bleaching protocol, um, which assesses corals at the genus level, all also growth forms, and its primary goal um, is the coral bleaching assessments uh, focus. And then we'll cover the georeference photo quadrat um, and reef cloud. Um, with, that required a little bit more technology um, than the other, at least one to two cameras and two GPS. And this method is the method that provides more spatial precision on benthic coverage. So let's start with the belt transect from Reef Check and the Global Reef Tracker. Um, this was founded in 97, and this method requires additional uh, training and testing in order to obtain the Eco Diver uh, certification. It's present in 40 countries and has trained more than 7,000 um, citizen scientists. So the next slide, we'll see that the method combines four main components into a 100 meter transect. Um, it applies a point intercept transect for benthic cover and also a belt transect for mobile invertebrates and bleaching. And this survey is called the invertebrate and impact survey that we'll talk a little bit as we move forward. Um, so if we go back just one moment, we'll see that the, um, that the 100 meter line transect line is separated into four independent um, 20 meter transects, which are separated by five meters. So ideally, uh, the best location to have georeference in this method uh, would be the middle of the, of the transects. So in the next slide, um, to talk a little bit of, about the um, substrate survey, um, this, this um, survey doesn't 
look at bleaching uh, specifically, but it's quite important because it looks at the major um, substrate types and benthic organisms. So it uses point sampling at 50 centimeters intervals with a plumb line. And, um, and that way we're able to have um, benthic cover estimates. So now the next one is the invertebrate and impact um, survey. And it does require bleaching in a bell transect, which is five meters wide and 2.5 meters wide at each side of the transects. And for this, for this um, method, if bleaching is present, two estimates are made on the percent coral cover. Um, and these are done on the percent of the coral of the total population and the percent of colonies. So first teams estimate the percentage of all corals during the transects that are bleached. And then second, they estimate the mean percent of each individual colonies that are bleached. So for example, we can assume that there's 10 corals and that three of those are bleached. So that would be 30% um, of that um, population of that transect. And then within those um, colonies, a mean percent of the, um, all the colonies are assessed. So let's say that only 25% of that, uh, those colonies were affected. So that would be the number that would be uh, recorded. And that would be done in the next data sheet that you can observe um, in the green in the green box. So the bleaching percent of coral po total population is done for every um, transect um, of 20 meters, and then the bleaching percent of colony as well. So the data sheets are available for these different regions, and they're available online on their web page. So once you have the data, you can enter the data um, and email it to the reef checks coordinator. Um, or you can also enter it in, in Mermaid. Um, however, there's a new platform that is currently under construction that will allow the upload of the data onto the platform. So um, stay tuned for that. So now we will continue um, to the rapid bleaching protocol from WCS and Mermaid. Um, so this protocol is conducted uh, via diving or snorkeling, um, and it's a roving method, so there's no need to lay out a, a transect line. It's a visual assessment of a quadrat from one to two meters squared, and usually it allows for a total of 15 to 20 quadrats per survey uh, per diver snorkel. Um, and within each quadrat, you identify the colonies to a genus, or also to growth forms, and you score them into seven categories of bleaching severity, which we'll see um, coming up. And then also when you visually estimate, um, oh, thank you. Um, when then you visually estimate the percent cover of hard coral, soft coral, and macroalgae. And so this method uh, was developed by McClanahan and Darling for the, um, 2016 bleaching event. And then we have Mermaid, uh, which is an open source application that collects and manages real-time data for coral reef health. So in the next slide, if you're in the Pacific and Indian Ocean, um, in your quadrat, you would identify up to the genus level or growth forms. And if you're in the Caribbean, you could do um, up to the, the species level. Uh, category and also genus or growth forms. And if you do select genus, um, then you record the following seven bleaching categories. And if you select, if you select the growth form, the categories become much um, slim, simpler. But here you can see the, the seven different bleaching categories. So when you're out in the field, next slide, you start with this um, sample underwater data sheet or your slate, 
and you have your genus identify, you have your categories and your different percentages, and you also have the recently dead category. Um, so what you do is through each of the quadrants that you are assessing, you are um, practically tallying each of those um, genus. And if you choose the next um, growth form option, then you write down the growth forms and then you have a simpler um, categories, normal, pale, bleach, and recently dead. And you do the same. You tally the number of um, colonies with the growth forms that you see from each of the quadrats. And from the quadrats, you also identify um, other information. If you, yes, and so on your slate, um, you'll see that you can put numbers of quadrats and then the percentage that you see of hard coral cover, soft coral cover, and macroalgae cover. And then this will tell you the number of quadrats that you have um, assessed. So you're moving along after your three quick swims and Ideally, for this method, you would have your GPS um, coordinate from either at the start and end um, or in the middle of where the, all the quadrats were taken to have a more accurate um, estimate of the location. So now you've collected all your data and you're already um, ready to input into the mermaid. This is the Marine Ecological Research Management aid. And next slide shows that it, it has the global um, platform and you can see that the dashboard has a summary of the countries, the projects, the sites, and the general trends um, of the information that has been submitted. And then um, in the next slide, first you start with your, um, with, with signing up. Um, and setting up your project. Um, here you can define the users that you also would like to include from your team, and you can prepare this for offline use. I like this um, uh, quality because we know that we don't have uh, the best internet in all locations. So this allows you to input the data offline as well. So next, you will see that you can collect um, the data either online or offline, and then you enter all the site specifics for your location, your transect information, um, and then you save each uh, individual one. Then um, you validate and you check the information and you submit it. Um, to make sure before that, you know, you run quality control to make sure there's no um, errors, and then you can submit the data. Next, you'll see that you can export the data um, either in a, uh, for further analysis in a Excel or in, in a, S, a CSV um, format. And then what you can see is that you can have um, other data that can be complementary. Maybe you also have uh, fish felt transects, um, and then you'll see here more information on the uh, coral bleaching component. So here you can see what the platform looks like. Um, first, you have to select the quadrat size, add the observer, and then there's other details that you can also complement with the visibility, depth, currents, um, or tides. And then you continue further down. It's basically one frame of information where you can put your benthic attribute, if it was the genus, um, you can also put the growth form and then the different information for each of the um, um, categories, pale, bleached, um, with the different categories, and then recently dead. So in the, um, in the bottom part, you're able to observe your final total numbers and you can save the information and um, you can download it. 
So yes, usually, and I um, didn't include this, but you'll, you're able to visualize the information on a dashboard that shows you the um, satellite imagery of where you've done your site and also a summary graph of the information that you have just inputted. So it helps you create graphs of the information that you just um, created. So now we'll move on to the, um, to the next method, the georeference photo quadrat method um, and the Reef Cloud platform. Um, so this method can be done via snorkeling or diving. Um, it can cover up to 200 meters up to a kilometer, and that's a lot of uh, swimming. And um, it's important to note that it does need additional um, photo GPS linking software. And this is available through um, uh, University of Queensland. And there's different specific protocols and manuals on how to sync the equipment. Um, each photo is a data point that can be tracked. Um, and this method is used to train and to validate the Allen Core Atlas habitat maps, and now most recently also the, the bleaching. And it uses also, it can be, uh, it works together with uh, either Coral Net or Reef Cloud. Um, Reef Cloud is a le recently launched uh, program. I think it was just launched last week. Uh, so congratulations. And um, this is a new photo analysis software, which uses machine learning um, also to help train um, the algorithms to help identify different benthic um, attributes. So um, then the next slide, you'll see some of the items and requirements that you need for the georeference photo quadrats. And to start, you need to prepare the GPS and the camera settings for calibration. And as I mentioned before, this is all carefully explained in a technical protocol that must be followed. Um, first, to calibrate the camera, you need a plumb bob. Um, and you need to calibrate a one meter square imaginary um, quadrat. So you can do this with um, already a quadrat established or also with, um, with paper. Um, then you need to sync the camera um, and the GPS. So you do this by taking a picture of the GPS and doing some previously settings on the GPS um, that you will be using on the float. Um, for the surveys. And you have to make sure that you have a good dry bag um, and you can also use some weights to stabilize the, the float um, once you're moving along, uh, either swimming or, or snorkeling. Um, something very important, dry runs are required um, to ensure that the equipment is properly um, synced. And there is also some previous planning that you need to do when you do select the sites, um, depending on the direction that you're going on the transect. And you also need to coordinate with the um, dive boat captains on if you're going north, if you're going south. So in the next slide, um, it shows a little diver with the uh, GPS float and um, taking a photo um, already calibrated with the plumb up at a one meter. Um, and before doing this, you start with a photograph of your slate where you put the date, the start time, um, the site name. Um, so there's no data sheet um, necessary, but you have your, your slate with information. Um, and then you start swimming along with a set um, direction um, that you already established, and you start taking photos in about every two to four kick cycles. So that gives you approximately um, three meters in distance. And most of the photos, or all the photos, need to be facing down at the same distance um, using the plumb bob as, a, as the reference. So next slide, um, some tips on the photos. Um, ideally you want, you have your camera set 
in underwater mode and there's also some other um, criteria to have the best um, high, high quality um, um, image. Also, if you have a red filter, it helps um, remove some of the, the green, the greenness of the um, images. Um, ideally, you like to move slowly, uh, face the camera downward, as mentioned, um, to keep the distance uh, consistent. And important to be able to distinguish the survey. So always taking a picture of the um, start and the end so that you know which side is which. Because in the end, you end up with about you know 200 to 500 pictures. And so it's important that you keep um, these segments um, separate. So these are just some images of three or four good pictures on the top and some really bad pictures on the bottom. Next slide. This is what it looks like when a diver is taking some um, photo quadrats and with the plumb bob um, and what the um, uh, photo quadrats look like of the reef. And then here's another person doing a snorkel. Um, yep. And we can go on to the next slide. So this is this is my best, this is my favorite part when you've done things correctly and you can link the photos to the GPS uh, coordinates. Um, so you do this with the, with the particular software that I mentioned and you download the photos, you relabel them, you organize them and you link them to the um, GPS. So once the photos are uh, renamed and are um, have a proper GPS position, in, usually you're able, the software can give you an output of a KML uh, file that you can upload onto Google Earth, for example, and you can see, um, when you click any of these points, you can see that the picture um, of the of the photo quadrat. So if you click Ben, um, you'll be able to see that you can connect to each of the individual points. It's an actual uh, photo um, geo reference of the track that you have followed. Um, so once you get to this point you can move on to, de uh, to derive the benthic cover data and the bleaching data uh, using uh, reef cloud. So once we're in reef cloud, um, this helps you manage the, the images, that all the images that you have. It helps you analyze manually um, and also with AI, um, and it can automate the analysis and reporting. So to do this, you start off with um, creating an account and setting up a project and users to your uh, team. Then you collect um, the images that you already have. You add the surveys to your site, you upload them, and you review your images to make sure that you only have photo quadrats and not pictures of uh, reefscapes or people, um, you should already have that cleaned up beforehand. And then you go on to the process of training the algorithms, analyzing the images and um, training the algorithm and validating the, the results. So once you get the results, you're able to export them for further analysis and you can share uh, with your team. And also um, if you want to make the information public, you can share it to the world. So next slide. Um, this is why the Reef Cloud platform uh, looks like. You can um, create a new project. This is a site that has already many different projects, Fiji, Caribbean, um, and um, you can also edit existing projects like add adding new sites to each of those locations. In the next slide, um, you can see, and my internet is um, you can see the, the, the images and 
select also um, how many different images. So some organizations use five points, some organizations use 10, some others even more. Um, and you can also assign different uh, labels. So in this gray box, if you can click, Ben, you'll, you'll be able to see, for example, uh, 15 simple benthic classes. And this is, for example, the classes needed for the verification maps um, of the atlas. Adding here um, the bleached um, hard coral cover category, but you can get as specific as you um, as you want in your in your study. Um, so here, for example, you have many different attributes of um, coral forms. And what I like about Reef Cloud is that you can be specific, but also um, reanalyze your information to become more um, general in your labels. And the next slide. Um, this is what the dashboard um, looks like. Then once you have inputted the information, um, you can see where the site locations are. And um, you can also have um, graphs already made of the, um, for example, hard coral cover over time, um, depending on the information that you have. And this is also available um, online. And to finalize the, the training, um, I like to finish off with five um, guides, five step guides to coral bleaching response. Um, and we'll do this before moving on to the, the Q and A section. So this is a five step summary guide that, um, that we have covered in the, in the training. Um, and to, to be able to respond to a bleaching event and that can be done anywhere in the world. So the first step is to identify a monitoring program. Here we've seen um, three different ones and also to review um, satellite-based warning systems. We um, saw the Alcor Atlas and the NOAA um, systems. So the second one, um, now I'm ready for, for the second one, is to learn a survey method, um, which will allow you to prepare, train, and learn a method um, in the water as well. So today you learned about three different types, the bell transect, um, which you can click, also the um, visual quadrats, which you can click, and uh, the, the georeference photo quadrat. So in the, um, the next third step is to be prepared to respond. Um, this is a very important one because here you need to secure funding, um, the tools that you need, um, the proper sampling, uh, identification of the sites, and also very important, a general strategy to reduce the stressor. So depending on the level of involvement that you have, um, with other coral reef conservation organizations, um, you can link up with them to, to do this. So for example, some locations close sites, um, close sites to tourism, or they um, further enhance already present uh, regulations. And the fourth one is the implementation of surveys and data collection. Um, so we apply this, um, also in this moment, the stress reduction stressors, um, and then you are in the process of monitoring the coral bleaching event. And the final and fifth one is to do the, set, the data synthesis and validation. So you can input the data collected into platforms. We already saw uh, three different ways, uh, th three different types and um, the data can be used to inform the status of bleaching um, to decision makers, uh, but also your data can help validate the Allen Core Atlas bleaching detection tool um, as well. So thank you for listening. We have now reached the um, Q&A section and Ben is going to help moderate this, 
the section. Thank you, Ben. No problem. All right. Um, so yeah, feel free to pop your questions into the Q and A um, or the chat, and we'll be we'll be looking for them. But the Q and A, I think, being the preferred. Um, so we have one question that's come in so far from Ahmed, and they ask, how can we use the data for coral conservation on the ground as we can't stop the stress of high temperatures? Mm, that's, a, that's a very good question. And as I was mentioning the um, step, the third step about applying re, um, stress reduction strategies, um, I think it's very important to, we don't wanna further go on the, the doom and gloom situation with coral bleaching, but we want to be able to monitor and show the information to, um, to be able to feed onto these global platforms that um, can be, um, can transform the information to policymakers to, to really assess the, um, the, the situation that we're in. Um, so I think that's one of the main ones because many times um, our monitoring efforts are done very scattered. Um, and sometimes when we do things in collaboration and together, I think we can send a better uh, message to, to our policymakers. Um, let's see, we have another question, this one from the chat. Um, I am wondering to know why there is a five meter gap in the belt transect method from Masa Salini. Okay, and that's a, that's a good question. So um, the, the reef check methodology does this to make those transects independent, um, independent transects. But at the same time, it helps you save, save time because you're laying out the 100 meter transect and you're working as a team with others who are monitoring um, other things, fish, some are doing the, um, the benthic transect. So it allows for more coordinations of the teams to, to be together. Um, but at the same time, that five meter separation allows for independent uh, transits. Um, sounds good. We have another question coming in um, from the Netherlands. Um, this person asks, um, I'm using different tools for different methods. How can we check where to go so we don't survey regions that have already been surveyed? Okay. Um, that's a good. That's a good question. So one of the um, um, one of the benefits of having this information be linked to data platforms is that you can go back to these uh, platforms to check what locations have been surveyed. So for example, um, you can go to Mermaid and see what methods. I mean, what um, areas have been monitored using WCS. Um, if you go to the Reef Cloud uh, platform, you can see what areas have been monitored using um, photo quadrats. And so it gives you more of an idea of um, what areas might have um, gaps of information. All right. Um, the next question, um, why is the peak season July onwards in the Pacific? Um, okay, this is about the different bleaching, the bleaching peaks. Um, okay, so I took those bleaching um, suggestions from the NOAA uh, platform. I know that with climate change and as the years move um, due to, you know, extreme um, sea surface temperatures, those uh, bleaching windows are changing. But I think that those were the, um, like the general uh, bleaching windows that were provided by um, the assessment for from 30 years of temperature from NOAA. Um, 
And those are very, very general. So they can vary depending on the locations where, where you are. I'm trying to search, yeah, where I found it from, but it is, it is the NOAA, the NOAA website. Great. Okay, um, next question. Um, for the georeferenced photo quadrant, what can we do if there is a strong current and the buoy will not align with the dive? Okay, that's a that's a very good question. That does happen um, when you have a strong current. So what you could do is, depending on your depth, also you have to be careful because you want to keep um, a constant depth, and um, you want to allow a certain um, uh, tightness of the reel. You don't want to give it too much reel, but at the same time, you don't want to keep it too um, too tight. Uh, I think what I've found that's very useful is having weights on the float because sometimes with the wind um, and with the currents, if it's not weighted down, it can, it, it moves a lot. Um, so that's what I found um, to be most helpful. And Sometimes you might have, you know, a one meter um, error if if the current is too strong. Great. Okay. Um, let's see. Um, another question coming in from the chat. Um, another question is about coral disease. In some cases, the signature of diseases is similar to coral bleaching. I'm wondering how you deal with this. I think that seems like that was, that was something you discussed, I believe. Yes, and that was that is for the um, for which method, or in general? Just in, in general, general. That's possible. just in general. Yeah, so that's actually one of the things that we're going to be testing out with the photo quadrat uh, method because the um, AI is not going to know if it's bleached because of a disease or if it's bleached um, because of uh, coral bleaching. So I think this gonna, it's, it's one of the limitations that we have, for example, with, um, with the photo quadrats. With uh, visually, I think it's um, what we've done in the past, for example, in the Mar region, is that we, we do the, the method simultaneously to record um, disease. So if, if, we see, if we see that there is bleaching and there's also disease, then we just try to have that number um, as a general percentage, but we also make a note that it's um, a disease like stony coral tissue loss disease or, um, or any other disease. Great, um, let's see. Um, this question is, is there any criteria for selection of areas and what are they? Thank you. Okay. Um, I suggest we move to the next slide. And then if you can please repeat the, the question, Ben. Uh, yeah, definitely. Sorry. Um, so the question is, is there any criteria for selection of areas and what are they? So I guess this, this might be selection of areas for surveying under any of the three um, methodologies you described. Mm -hmm. I think it depends on, on your resources and also where you're based and um, how many people can also um, be with you and your team. So I think uh, logistically, those are things that you have to think about. But if we go to the physical factors such as, um, you know, that I talked about, like selecting different habitat types, um, different locations and having um, replicates for, you know, um, same, uh, same depth sites in the same uh, similar habitats, then, then those are other criteria. But I think it's going to also have, um, and the and the specifically, the um, 
yeah, the location that you're in. Thanks. All right, um, next question uh, is an interesting one. Could we use the Reef Check survey method to collect data and photos and then use Reef Cloud for photo analysis? Yeah, you can do combinations of, of methods as long as as long as you're taking the the minimum criteria from each of the methods you can combine and i think it depends also you know if you if you want to use them just for validation or if you also have another um, scientific question um, that you want to answer within your surveys as well Okay. Um, let's see. Um, another one. Uh, this person asks about the rapid survey from WCS. Um, should we identify the macroinvertebrate observed in the macroinvertebrates observed in the quadra? Mm, in the in the quadra, it's always um, we always want to have the most information but for for this method it, we only have those three general um categories so i believe it's um hard coral cover um soft coral cover and also um macroalgae we are working to suggest um, abiotic um covers so for example if there's sand um, or rubble that that gets um, documented so that we have a more um, thorough understanding of the benthic cover in general terms. Okay, um, we have one that Chris would like to answer. Um, this is Eureka from Indonesia. Reef cloud and coral net seem to be similar. If we have used coral net before, can we simply import our data from coral net to reef cloud? Um, so can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you, Chris. So, so you can integrate those two platforms. What I'm not sure of, and I have to tell with Ma Manu, if, if you have already analyzed data, if you get it into Reef Cloud to get the reporting, but I do think that's the case. But, uh, but you can, for instance, the training data that you created in CoralNet can also be integrated in Reef Cloud and then photos can be reclassified using that training data. And it would uh, create a percent cover and benthic category for every for each benthic category. So not only the coral or bleaching categories for each category. All right, great, thank you. Um, let's see, our next question. Um, do you have any tips on what to do if we accidentally messed up with the photos when we were using the photo contract transect um, so that we don't miss any data or have blank spots in our observation area? So I guess what to do if you are taking photos and some of them or one or two of those are, are off somehow. So the question is, um, what tips I recommend for a photo that has not been correctly taken or i believe i believe that's the question yeah okay so if if your photo is blurry for example and um, i would just suggest el el eliminating it for example because um, it's the um, the program well first of all you manually are not going to be able to be able to differentiate what um, the benthic cover is and then the ai is not going to be able to do it um, and if you've um, maybe gone a little bit further up on the um, plumb bob let's say that you know um, centimeters i think cutting the 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 image will make the um, will reduce that that error but i think it also depends on um, what kind of mistake is done to the to the image that makes sense 
Um, this person asks, should we also document bleaching in non-corals, giant clams, anemones, etc.? I do think it's it's important. Um, I know for the majority of the um, of the methods, the focus is on um, hard coral cover um, and identifying the percentage of bleaching on hard uh, corals. Uh, but I do think that um, if many different invertebrates are indicators of, um, of bleaching events. So I would say to record that information as well, maybe not throughout the, um, the, the methods because they don't include them, but as a note um, of your transect, I think it's quite, uh, quite important. For example, in the Caribbean, um, the invertebrate palitoa, which is very common, um, it's an indicator that there's um, temperature changes. So I do think it's important to record. Okay. All right. Um, this is a question about a, a different program. Um, so this person asks, Next. have you tried to, oh, sorry, Andrea, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Um, this person says, have you tried to use the coral point count with Excel, Excel extension made by Kohler and Gill for analyzing coral bleaching quadrat photos? Some people in Indonesia are familiar with it, and it can also produce the percent coverage for each benthic category. I just want to know your thoughts about the program. Yeah, I think Coral uh, Point Count is an excellent uh, program, and um, it's been used many times before. It's quite uh, quite common program, so I do I do recommend it as well. Um, I didn't mean to exclude you know other great programs out there, but we just you know focused on just a few examples. So um, I think it's it's a great program as well. And it does uh, provide good um, summaries that could also um, help uh, provide the data for validation. Yes. And I think Chris can complement on that as well, if you like to jump in on that, Chris. Uh, yeah. Yes, so thanks for that, Andrea. So coral point count is a very val valuable program and it has been used many times. Uh, I've done thousands of photos with it. However, the challenge of, of the coral point count is that it's completely manual, where uh, reef cloud and, um, uh, or coral net are actually a process where you almost do the same thing for a set part uh, uh, for the same thing as you do for coral net, but only for, a, let's say, 5% of all your photos, 10% maybe. And then the remaining photos are automatically analyzed using the training data that you created. So there's always a manual component in automatic photo analysis, but usually that's only on a small set of all the photos, where coral point count is, is only manual. So that requires more more time as well. Um, I'm just looking for other questions. And again, feel free to plug your questions into the Q&A. Um, that's the easiest place for us to track them. Um, but you can put them in the chat too, I guess, if it's an emergency and the chat is the first thing that you have and the only thing you have. Um, Q&A preferred though. Uh, let's see. Uh, this person asks, are there okay, sites... I was just answering a question to Steve Fisher. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. Sorry, there's a little bit of a lag. <laughs> um, but yeah, I was just going to say that um, um, I would like to connect with Steve Fisher. I was just answering his question um, about um, how uh, the... Um, another type of method can be incorporated into the program. So yes, I would be glad to connect with you and, and see if it can be done and how it can be done. Great. Alrighty. Um, this person asks, are there sites globally where you can rent, attend, or intern a field study? Yeah. 
what was that question again? Sorry, uh, Ben. Yeah, I think this, this person is interested in participation, basically, where they can participate in a field survey. Um, yeah, if there's an easy way for them to do that. Okay, perfect. Yes, I think it depends on what location um, in the world they are. And I would suggest uh, for them to reach out to us um, via email, and then we can see the best location where we can link them up with um, different organizations um, so that they can help out uh, with, the, with the surveys or also with um, data analysis if they don't want to move, but I'm sure that they would like to get in the water. Um, let's see, I'm just scrolling through. Um, is, uh, let's see, a technical question. Um, got it. Okay. Um, this person is asking about distinguishing causes of coral mortality from coral bleaching. Um, are there any indicators to know if corals are bleaching or if they're being affected by surface runoff? that may cause discoloration that looks like it's bleaching? Yeah, so when we have um, sedimentation or water um, runoff, um, it can be even just fresh water or, or also with sediments um, and chemicals, um, we can have bleaching from different um, water quality issues. So. I think uh, documenting it, um, depending on the information that you know about the site, if the, you know that there's um, an issue happening or there's the rainy season and you start seeing bleaching, um, that sometimes you can differentiate it um, based on the, the moment it's happening. Um, it may be hard if you have this situation and then also um, heat stress on top of that. So I think, um, yes, uh, that would be a hard one if it's happening all at the, at the same time because it could be um, synergist synergistic and confounding factors that might be um, affecting the, the bleaching. All right, and then maybe piggyback onto that. Um, really quickly, there's a question about, um, what about recording species like Drupella, black spot, and cots to distinguish disease from bleaching? So that's a good one. And I think um, I'm, I mentioned it in one of the slides of differentiating um, predators um, that can you know, leave marks from mortality, and then it can be confused as um, as bleaching. I think when you're doing the surveys, it's just the surveys. It's important that you, you know, take a moment not just to write down the information really quickly, but to um, make sure that you are looking throughout the area. I've seen it many times where you just, you know, look a little bit under the um, ledge, and then you start seeing. Um, all these um, snails, for example. Um, I think to complement the methods, um, for example, Reef Check does have it in, in its invertebrate um, survey. For example, the WCS one um, doesn't, but you can also make a note um, of that. And um, the most important thing is to not be able to um, account that as, as bleaching, being able to differentiate it. Sounds good. I'm just looking through the most recent batch of questions that have come in to see if I can find some more. Uh, this is a fairly technical question, but this person is just wondering whether there are any cameras you recommend for the geo-referenced photo surveys? Yes, we recommend the, um, the Olympus uh, Tough camera. Um, I've been through so many cameras throughout my um, my survey uh, days, and um, I think I've flooded many ones too. So I highly recommend the um, uh, the tough 
the Olympus Tough, and it has a casing for extra protection because it can only go up to 15 meters. So if you're um, in areas where you might just be um, a little bit under that, I suggest to have the, the casing and it's a very good camera. Okay. Sorry, I'm just looking through the questions. I see that there's a question about, I will be delighted to cooperate in the Egyptian uh, Red Sea. That is great. Please contact us, um, Ahmed. We would like to uh, connect with you. We have connections in the, um, in the Red Sea and different organizations that you can also link up. Um, so yes, we'll love to, to connect with you. And then there's another one. Is it worth to invest in ROVs instead of having a diver do it? especially if you have limited experience divers. I'd say if you, if you have the money, <laughs> I think ROVs are quite um, expensive. So it depends on the institution or the organization and the, um, and the financial um, requirements. And um, so, but I think ROVs are quite useful for also deeper areas where um, the, it's, where it's harder to, to reach due to the technicalities of diving deep. Uh, this person is asking, uh, reefs are not always flat. The plumb bob method restricts you to flat areas. Couldn't you use a one meter long section of PFC pipe on slopes? Hi, um, Dr. Fenner. Yes, you are, um, yes. I think the, the method can be modified to use the, um, uh, like PVC pipe. Um, I think for the most part, it's it's a little bit more uncomfortable to, to dive with a PVC, but um, I've also done it many times in, in the Mesoamerican where you we have a, um, a PVC uh, one meter thick. So I think, um, yes, adapting um, as, as it makes the method easier, is always um, is always um, is always good. Okay. Um, this person asks, where can we collaborate or contribute in Queensland, Australia? Oh, great. So, um, Julie, yes, there's many places that. Um, that you can connect with in Australia, many organizations. Um, it depends um, which method you would like to uh, use. But um, for example, uh, the photo quadra method is in the University of Queensland. So I think that would be the, the closest one. I am sure um, you can connect with Chris and, and can help out some somehow. Um, and I do know that um, Reef Check Australia is also doing some surveys. Um, I am not sure if they're doing them in Queensland, but yes, please reach out to us and um, we will try to connect you to uh, an organization where you can help out. Um, well, I think that, um, oh, let's see, we have one more. Uh, Steve Fisher is asking how we can connect later to discuss, and I have that. Uh, Andrea, I believe you'd like to, to talk about that last. Sure. I got so his we, email through the chat, too. Oh, and you can also sure. move to the, ne the next slides that have the contact information. Okay. Perfect. Yeah, I was just going to mention that. Um, 
there are some other resources uh, that you can further look into if you're interested in learning more about the Allen Core Atlas um, and remote sensing. Um, there's the Reef Resilience Network course. We also have other workshops and information in the YouTube channel um, and new workshops coming up soon. And then on the next slide, I believe there's the contact um, information and then we have a poll also um, that we can do. All right. So before we go on to the, um, the contact information, so we're interested to know um, what methods and what platforms are you most likely to use? Quite curious about that. And um, we would like to know if you feel ready to monitor a coral bleaching event. And if you are, um, if you have the resources you need or if you want but lack financial support, um, or if you are lacking trained uh, people to do it um, or not planning to monitor a bleaching event. So we're getting the answers in. We'll give it a minute. I guess in the meantime, I would just like to um, to follow up on the question about the, um, the soft corals. And um, it's been also a, a question that I've had um, many times discussed with the, uh, the remote sensors uh, scientists, remote sensing scientists. To, to see how important it is to measure um, soft coral and the percentage of bleaching. And if that's able to, if we're able to see that from satellite images. So I think that's something that I still haven't um, had the answer, but I think if we, that it's a good idea that for us to consider that percentage and then be able to, to validate it and see if we can actually see it from, um, from the Sentinel images. So thank you. All right, and I think we're pretty much have most of the answers. So we kind of have a tie <laughs> or, all right, we're sharing the results now. Thank you, Ben. Um, so we have sort of a tie between the Bell Transect Reef Check and the Rapid Bleaching Protocol from WCS, um, and then a higher percentage, 45% um, for the georeference photo quadrats, and 35 of the 35% of the participants um, are ready to monitor and have all the resources need, uh, but 47% do you want to monitor but lack the financial support? And about 25% um, lack the people who are trained to do the monitoring. So thank you very much for, um, for sharing. So here is a slide with our contact information. Um, we are also interested to know where bleaching events are occurring um, currently. So if you have observed bleaching in any of the locations that you're in right now, please let us know via the chat. Um, we're very uh, curious to, to track the, the bleaching um, spread. And uh, thank you very much for joining us. Um, this is the information um, to contact us. We will be also following up with the recording of this training um, and share it with 
um, with everybody and that was not able to join. Um, and also the ones who want to share the information further. So if you'd like to let us know if you have seen any bleaching in anywhere in the world where you are, please let us know via, via the chat. Thank you very much. <laughs> Getting all the thank yous. And Chris, did you want, I see you're typing the answer. Did you want to answer the question about volunteering for remote sensing or GIS? I think Chris is, is typing it. Or is it, yeah, I wasn't typing it. I think it's Chris. Yeah, I know. Yes, it does say that, but it has for a while. So I just. Oh, he did. Yeah. Okay. And um, have we gotten anybody to tell us no if there's bleaching in their locations? I don't think so. <laughs> Thank you for hosting this event. Looking forward to putting these methods to use. Great. And we have another comment for Queensland, Australia folks. The Great Barrier Reef Marine Park Authority has the multi-tool eye on the reef program with four tools, three being underwater visual surveys that includes photos since 2012 and it is in early stages of being integrated into reef cloud or photo analysis. That is great, um, Chris. We would like to connect with you to learn more about the, the tool. I have seen the app. Um, so yes, we'd love to connect with you further on that. If you can send your email, <laughs> that would be great. Thanks also to those of you who are putting your, your bleaching locations in the chat. That's really helpful. So if before you leave, you've seen bleaching, let us know. Perfect. Perfect. I saw very little bleaching in Indonesia two weeks ago. Okay. In Brazil, last event in 2020. Okay, thank you for sharing. Yes, we're very um, interested to know where bleaching is occurring uh, currently um, in the Pacific. We're trying to follow uh, social media and also um, informal observations of, um, of bleaching because we would like to you know, coordinate with people on the ground to see um, how uh, bleaching can be monitored in, in different areas. So it's it's always good to have a, a heads up on on where you know paling or um, bleaching is being observed. Perfect. Okay, Western, Western Australia has seen some, some mild bleaching. Okay, that's interesting because I did see that there was a lot of heat stress concentrating in the area. So um, thank you for sharing. Okay, well, thank you very much for everybody um, joining in. I really appreciate um, your, your support and thank you 
um, for those who stick through it. <laughs> and thank you, Ben, for helping me with the um, my technical difficulties um, with the with the internet and all my internet backups. Um, but thank you, everybody, for joining in. Thank you, Helen, as well for all your support and every uh, other of the participants, Chris, for helping answer all the hard um, questions and helping answer the questions in the chat. We had a lot of them. <laughs> so um, thank you very much for, for your participation and have a great rest of your day and good evening um, to the people in the Atlantic. Thank you.